Hello and welcome to IoT Builders, a live stream where we discuss a range of topics on the Internet of Things, from embedded devices to cloud services, all from an IoT builder perspective. This is episode three, and today we have Steve Borsay joining us, who is an AWS IoT hero to talk about IoT services, training and education, hardware, and uh, his new book called AWS Serverless IoT, Inexpensive IoT Projects to Take You from Zero to AWS IoT Hero. My name is Dan Gross, and I'm a senior developer advocate at AWS, uh, working on free RTOS. And I am joined by uh, my colleagues today, Alina and Nanad. Uh, hey, Alina, how's it going? Hi. Hi, Dan. Hi, everyone. Um, and yeah, welcome to, to our IoT Builder session today. Um, I'm Alina Dima. Um, I'm a senior developer advocate for AWS IoT for connectivity and control services. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to be here today. Alina, are you there? Yes, I'm here. So hi, everybody. I'm Nenad. I'm a senior developer advocate at AWS uh, uh, around IoT, of course, as my colleagues as well. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear oh. you. Can you hear me? Excellent. Yes, yes. Very good. <laughs> Wonderful. Everything works. I love it. <laughs> so then, um, we are. I'm not able to hear you. At least I'm not sure what about the others. Or I just switched my mic on. If you can hear me. <laughs> Yes, I can hear you. So maybe Steve, you can ah, introduce yourself. Okay, I'm yeah, sorry, I'm Steve. sorry, guys. I uh, I was having some audio issues. I couldn't hear anybody, but now I can. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so let's uh, let's uh, uh, get back to it. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Nanad. Uh, you were saying. No, yeah, I introduced myself, and then I wanted to give opportunity for Steve to introduce himself. Yeah. Hey, Steve. Uh, why don't you uh, Why don't you unmute and introduce yourself? Thanks a lot for uh, for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. This is my first time using Twitter Spaces, so I apologize for being a little slow on the uptake. So, um, my name is Stephen Borse. I'm a computer engineer, IoT engineer, and I am working in device to cloud communications, specifically with AWS currently doing teaching and training materials. I have courses online on AWS IoT on Udemy, and as Dan already mentioned, I just published a book recently, and I'm looking to, to convert that in paperback, and then I might put out a second edition pretty soon and add a couple bonus chapters. So that's what I've been up to right now. That's great. That's really great. Um, yeah, uh, we'd love to dive into uh, some topics around your, your book. Um, it's uh, it's really interesting. Uh, I I grabbed a copy myself, but uh, uh, it's uh, it's it's really nice that you're taking kind of a simplistic approach to using AWS IoT um, uh, with uh, serverless services, and uh, and really, uh, it seems like anybody could get started with with this approach. Yeah, that was the idea of the book exactly, because currently, you know. Most people, especially professional third-party consulting firms who are going to partner with AWS for IoT, are going to look for more complete production-ready solutions. So what I found in general before I started with the cloud, I was doing more device programming and then moved to IoT, is a lot of people, even if they have computer, you know, computer engineering or software backgrounds formally trained, they have problems getting started with IoT because that ramp up can be a little bit confusing because it's the integration of both the device, software, and the cloud side. So at least at a beginner level, you have to put the basics together. So my intention with the book was to be able to get, whether it was a hobbyist, beginning engineers, or someone who was new to I IoT, up to speed 
how to communicate with the AWS cloud from these common, pretty inexpensive, easy to use devices like the ESP32, ESP8266, and the Raspberry Pi. And then from there, once they wanted to go to more professional development after you know completing the hands-on projects in the book or in my course, then they can look at something like free RTOS and using a more, you know, bare metal C with an RTOS on it, something like that. So is this really a way to get started and then understand the basic kind of IoT-centric IoT services AWS has to offer? Yeah, this is great. I, I think um, either Dan was muted or... Um... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm still having audio issues here. I was muted. Yeah, apologies. Go ahead, Ninad. No, I think this is really interesting. I, I think, you know, the bridging that gap between, uh, you know, having the hardware and then how you develop on that hardware specifically to connect to the I I I IoT services in general is something that, you know, it's definitely not that widespread. So you have those uh, segments of like people understanding the hardware, developing software on the embedded systems, and then you have the other side of like cloud and, and so forth. But yeah, bridging that gap is really important. And then what is the entry point for this? So that's that's really cool to have kind of that guiding material that you provided. So. Yeah, and it's nice that you use the ESP32 and ESP8266, really um, you know, low-cost and readily available uh, hardware to walk through the examples. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, working with uh, IoT Core and MQTT, you make it, uh, you make it uh, pretty, you know, pretty straightforward, pretty simple, uh, you know, looking um, for, for publishing and subscribing to... Um, um, you know, to the service. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a lot of the intention of the book. I mean, obviously for us, everybody here, it's pretty easy. But, I mean, even if you go on, like, YouTube and watch, like, how to connect your ESP device to AWS IoT, it's not always really clear because there's so many gotchas you have to worry about as far as subscription topics or how you set up the buffer size relative to the MQTT library how you intercept those topics at AWS IoT Core. So it is really problematic for a lot of people to get started. And then, as you mentioned earlier, and I probably should have talked about this before rambling on, is first of what you said is making this a serverless kind of centric approach is good because I have a lot of students in the Middle East or India, South America, that don't want to spend a lot of money opening and running EC2 instances. So by keeping everything kind of AWS IoT Core, AWS Lambda and a lot of stuff on S3 for visualization of static websites. It makes everything pennies a day. So that that's super handy for people. So yeah, that's that's, been real that, that's really awesome. And and so you do a lot of uh, education and training. Um, and I think a lot it seems like a lot of the examples and uh, and projects in the book uh, do they come from that? Is that is that where um, you know, you've you've um, discovered a lot of what people are asking, and you know how how people are working with the services. Yeah, that's exactly right. Super good point. So, again, once they have this problem of like, how do I integrate the device side with the cloud side, and then once I'm on AWS, what are the typical services that are going to be the foundation for any IoT centric design? So, by going over students' needs, you know, some students, especially if they come from a computer science background are going to understand uh, Python, or they're going to be working in Arduino wiring code, which is kind of a C, C++ environment, or they might even be a front-end web developer used to using JavaScript. So besides, like we just spoke about, keeping these services super cheap, we can. I also have examples in MicroPython, Arduino, and Mongoose using um, JavaScript so whatever language they're comfortable in, we can show them, I can show them how to connect with AWS IoT via the MQTT protocol and send data up to AWS. So then from AWS IoT core, this IoT data can get dispatched to any of these inexpensive serverless services on AWS. So kind of trying to cover all bases with that for the beginning to intermediate developers. 
Yeah, and actually what, uh, what I find very interesting is that you've got a chapter on, uh, on AWS provisioning, uh, which I think uh, from my experience is probably one of the most challenging sides of IoT as part of what you were saying, uh, getting the devices connected in the first place. Do you have a lot of students who are asking you about provisioning in particular and trying out different mechanisms to provision their devices? What's your experience there? Yeah, I would say that's one of the more challenging parts, especially you know on the hardware side. So on the cloud side, as you know, there's a couple different ways to provision. We can create a thing and get our security certificates to match TLS 1.2 that way. I generally just download all three certificates, create kind of an open IoT policy. And whenever I set up these policies and permissions on AWS to keep things easy, I always say, you know, we'll keep things pretty much give you not following the least privilege model, but give you a ton of access. And then once you have this working, you can kind of dial back your permissions. So we'll create the certificates in the AWS region they're using, attach the IoT policy, and then whether we're using MicroPython, uh, Mongoose, as you know, it's done automatically for you, but also for MicroPython Arduino, they can embed this private certificate, client certificate, X509 root certificate directly on the device. So like you said, there's a little bit of unfun overhead and complication with basic provisioning. Obviously, this isn't talking about just-in-time or fleet provisioning. We're talking about provisioning for one or two few devices. But once they understand how the provisioning works and how to put these certificates on the device, then everything after that is kind of pretty easy for them. But that, again, is something that confuses new students when they start with IoT to cloud communications, especially with AWS, because they require pretty good security. You know, they're very big on security, much more so than their competitors. If you've ever connected to your competitor's cloud, you know it's much easier as far as what the device requirements are as far as security goes. So once they understand how to use these certificates, everything gets a lot easier. Yeah, that's um, that's a good point. Um, the mutual authentication is the is always the trick. Um, but uh, once you get over that, then uh, then things really fall into place. So, but it's that whole uh, zero to one uh, to n. Um, you know, type of uh, type of transition. Uh, if you can get from zero to one. Uh, and then one to end, uh, you know, everything is uh, everything is good. Yeah, I think what I what I also find interesting is, uh, you know, that you've got some content uh, in the book focusing uh, on what happens uh, in the cloud. And I think a lot of developers find this very interesting because, you know, there are so many database solutions. Um, there are so many ingestion mechanisms, so many things you can do in AWS. Uh, so I think it's really interesting that you go through, uh, you know, the basics and and walk, um, you know, the developers through through these mechanisms, like you know, using DynamoDB, using TimeStream, and so on. Yeah, uh, like that's that's like a really important thing to understand a basic IoT centric design flow on AWS, and this design flow. You know, obviously your competitors are going to have similar products, but if they're using AWS specifically. It's going to, and you're working with IoT, you're going to see the same design patterns over and over. So, again, even though the book is not going to cover corner cases for production level design, and that keeps the code a lot smaller, which is helpful for new students, you're going to understand these basic design flows of like, how do I put data into a data lake and then get data out of the data lake to an S3 static website for visualization? That'll cost me five cents a day. Or if I want to use a database, then I can use DynamoDB or, you know, a specific time scale database like a time stream. How do I query that from Lambda? And then also, do I want to visualize that in QuickSight, which can be a little more expensive? And then I always offer through all these chapters in the book, here's some basic web code to visualize these things in a static S3 site for pennies a day. And then as was mentioned earlier, they might want to do more advanced queries or they might want to have bigger lambdas, which may cost a little bit more, maybe use a reactive website like Angular View or React itself, React.js, and then using Amplifier AppSync, that can cost a little bit more, but those are the options they have later if they want to kind of expand on these basic IoT-centric design flows. 
<laughs> yeah, I particularly like your um, your example of just using um, uh, an S3 bucket and uh, a static web page to update a, a dashboard with IoT data. I think um, you know uh, it's it's a simple solution, but it's uh, it's also pretty effective as a as a good baseline. Um, you know, to to set up your um, your devices to see that uh, you know the data is being captured how how you'd expect in the in the cloud, um, and it's it's really not that difficult to set up that way. I think we make a lot uh, you know we we make a lot of noise about uh, you know dashboards and things and analytics and things like that that uh, sometimes can get a little more complicated. But uh, this uh, this simple scenario you've got here actually. Uh, really, you know, hammers home the, the the basics that you need to need to know about that. Yeah, that's an interesting example to uh, demonstrate. And I, I will say, I do have an advantage not working for AWS and being kind of a third party consulting trainer. Is I can do these kind of lower end basic examples. Whereas if you work for AWS you're not really able to say, hey, here's kind of a least privileged, easy, you know, something without the bells and whistles, because then you're probably going to get, I don't know, maybe you get harassed a little bit by everybody. So I can kind of uh, use some dumbed down examples to get people started and say, hey, you know, this is not the professional production way to do things, but at least doing like the example you talk about where I do a synchronous fetch from an AWS, uh, an S3 bucket, and then every json iot package right overwrites the previous one and we're doing so we're missing packages we're missing data we don't fetch every single piece of data but for like five cents a day you know we can get a basic visualization of most of the data we want to do and it's just a great way to get started without again all the complications and corner cases and everything that normally if you're an engineer at aws you're going to have to provide to people because if you don't, they're going to come back and say, hey, what about this case? What about this? This doesn't cover these errors. So I have a little bit of an advantage as far as that goes. Mm. So question, um, I, I, I did an observation uh, in this, uh, and I saw uh, that in your book, you're basically guiding um, uh, readers from setting up a virtual device uh, and then sending a data, then obviously setting it up on a MicroPython and then a hardware device just such as Pi and then using AWS IoT SDK. So the question in terms of how are you finding if you had any feedback from your uh, readers or uh, attendees where you, know, you have saw this has made the learning curve a lot easier in terms of them learning and adapting and understanding the knowledge of connecting to AWS IoT? Yeah, that's a great point. So especially with the Raspberry Pi, utilizing that with AWS IoT device SDKs, you know, I show examples in Python and Node, and you can use these more abstracted languages. So this is much more comfortable for people with a computer science background, I've noticed, you know, just from the meetup groups that I ran in the past, people with a computer science who are more formally trained programmers don't necessarily want to use Arduino because they don't come from a embedded device programming background. So mm -hmm. when I set these different IDEs up with these different languages, it's giving the students to connect to AWS IoT in a manner they're comfortable with. So a lot of people that use the Raspberry Pi specifically, as I mentioned, to be more used to using higher, high more abstracted languages where people who are using you know, Arduino, especially if they're using free RTOS or bare metal C, they're going to be more used to using lower level languages, but it's like, you know, as a community who's interested in IOT and cloud centric services on AWS, you have all these options of how to connect. And I think that's surprising to new students because most people that are just getting into connecting to the cloud are like, they just want to get one thing working, but the first thing they get working might not be in a language they're comfortable with at all. So that's kind of one of the, one of the thing I wanted to show through the first seven chapters of the book is here are all these ways to connect. And then you mentioned the virtual devices. So using MQTFX or using MQT Explorer, using a bash, strip, a bash script, which directly connects to the AWS CLI and sends IoT data that way. It's like 
that's good for students who may not even have a device yet or they don't want to buy a device. Maybe they can't afford what they want to buy. So they can get comfortable using a virtual device in the language they want without even really having to own a hardware device. And then if they like it, they can go back on their own and buy the hardware device. So it's all about providing options for different students that are comfortable with different things. Great. So I think yeah, I'm, I'm guessing that it has actually lowered the learning curve for your readers on adapting and, you know, uh, taking uh, uh, connecting devices to AWS IoT or to the cloud. Yeah, for sure. And it's actually been surprising to me what people were most interested in. Like before I went to MicroPython as this more generic open source Python source, I was using Xerniff because they were really ahead of the curve. You're probably familiar with them. They made their own kind of MicroPython language to connect to AWS IoT. They kind of went in a different direction to be profitable selling hardware. But I was very surprised how many students were interested in using that specific IDE and not Arduino. Because when I got into teaching and training, you know, I went to Arduino to teach people basics of embedded development. But there's all kinds of people that are way more comfortable using a Raspberry Pi with a more abstracted language or Xerniff at the time to connect to AWS. So, yeah, I learned a lot about what people's preferences were, and I realized they were all over the board. They weren't really just with one thing. And if you were to, um, I guess, um, increment the version of the book, uh, what would be the extra learnings you would probably incorporate in the future editions of the book, which might help reader further? So the chapters that I'm thinking of expanding the book would kind of be more on the advanced side without getting too crazy, but I would probably show them how to set up an open, kind of an open source MQTT broker and then you can use the MQTT client on the static website and then you put in your Cognito, um, and this is still very cheap to do, put in your Cognito federated identity, and then people can send data directly from their device without even going through IoT Core to their static website using the, MQ, uh, using the um, actually it's using the AWO IoT device SDK in JavaScript directly on their browser by using a static S3 site. I think that's a really interesting thing that most people have no idea they can use and they would be using AWS as the server-side MQT client. And then the other thing I, I, that's possible, I don't know if it's still possible with the ESP8266. I'm sure it's still possible with ESP32 because of how Wi-Fi secure is done. If they don't even want to go through IoT Core or they have bigger payloads they want to send, here's how they can use H, uh, HTTP on their device to go directly from their device to API Gateway and then API Gateway use an integrated Lambda function, and then from Lambda, obviously, is probably your most important IoT-centric service, dispatch data or do ETL on their data and send that data anywhere. So just putting these kind of high-level ideas in new developers' minds, then the whole world of IoT on the cloud kind of opens up. Because I think a big challenging block for most new people, most people new to IoT they're just, they don't know what's possible on the cloud, especially because AWS offers so many services. It's like they may not only think of like, well, I can store data in S3 or I can store data on a database. But after that, I really don't know what I would do with the data. So, you know, opening their eyes to all these different ways to have all these IoT centric services work, I think is, and I would, and the other thing I would probably do is that, um, shadow device services. So I do have that in my course showing people how to use shadow devices, but I would probably also add that as another chapter in the book. So those are kind of the three chapters I had in mind for expanding the book. This and is I'd love to see, I'd love to see a free Artos uh, uh, example as well. <laughs> yeah, I probably should add something. I actually do have that in the course, so I probably should add something like that for sure, because it is very important. And there are people who obviously have questions on fleet, uh, fleet deployments and uh, free RTOS for more advanced development that they definitely want to do. So I probably should add something like that. 
Yeah, and maybe, you know, uh, an idea could be to, to consider adding some device management functionality, you know, just uh, just showing them how to group devices based on some attributes and, uh, you know, do do some basic device management, maybe use IoT jobs and, and show them how to, you know, send the job document to the device and the device would pick it up. I think this could be also an interesting topic. Yeah, no, I think it would be for sure. In fact, if I do the second edition, I'll probably get it published with a more of a traditional publisher. Um, and then in that case, if they would be willing to have this more advanced material and they would expand the book, that's probably what I would want to do. Because I kind of did this first edition just to kind of test out the market, but I've kind of decided for a second edition that I would definitely want to have a traditional publisher for it. So if they're open to that, I would definitely look into doing more of that kind of stuff. Yeah, really great. Um, hey, uh, just a just a, a check in here. Um, if you're just joining us, um, this is IoT Builders, and uh, we are joined today by Steve Borsay, who's um, uh, got a new book out called AWS Serverless IoT: Inexpensive IoT Projects to Take You from Zero to AWS IoT Hero. And uh, and we're we're talking about um, topics in the book, uh, and you know some other things too uh, that uh, Steve's involved in. Um, my name is Dan Gross. I'm joined by my colleagues Nanad, Alina, and Syed. Uh, and um, thanks a lot for uh, for joining. And if you're if you're uh, if you have any questions uh, during the show and and, and want to uh, want to chat with us, just um, just signal that in the in Twitter Spaces here, and uh, and we'll uh, we'll take your your question or comment. Um, okay, so let's see, let's 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 uh, let's get back to it. Um, you know, something that's uh, kind of interesting is this this uh, we've we've been talking a lot about the book and um, and about the serverless uh, services services, um, but you have quite a, a hardware background as well, and uh, in particular. Uh, the thing I thought was really interesting is this um, this project that you've got called CloudBoard, um, and uh, you can you can find out more about it at cloudboard.cc uh, is the URL. But um, tell us a little bit about this CloudBoard. It's uh, it's a really uh, nifty um, development board, uh, and how how did that come about? Thank you for mentioning CloudBoard. <laughs> my new my new hardware device yeah so uh before the pandemic hit i was uh i have a meetup group here in portland it has over a thousand members and i'm like and i was having pretty regular iot based meetups and i'm like well always the issue with you know hands-on technical training and teaching is if people are fiddling with wires and hooking up sensors to devices you know whether they're using free rtos or whether they're using you know more basic environments it doesn't change that the hardware has these voltages going around and these resistive capacitance uh, PCBs, and it's easy to short out circuits. It takes time to set up these sensors. So I'm like, well, you know, there's these other boards out there. Why don't I make a cloud-specific board, you know, so I, we don't have to deal with uh, prototyping these individual sensors. So someone posted a picture that I think was originally designed by AWS engineer of kind of a cloud design PCB board. I go, this is a, and it got a really popular response on the AWS Heroes channel. So I'm like, well, there's some stuff that I would switch around and do differently, but the fundamental idea is very good. I don't know if that board was ever produced or was still in prototyping stages. So I kind of designed this thing, laid it all out, and it was pretty easy to do. Um, all the chips that we needed were in stock despite the silicon shortages. So, uh, yeah, each board was able to be produced for like $20 a board. And then the, I had a hand solder, the OLED screens, because that can't be done with SMT manufacturing. But the whole point behind the board is like an ESP, ESP32 chip with the sensors attached on the board. So doing a live training workshop then the students didn't have to fiddle around with uh, wiring and doing jumper cables. And in my past experience, like blowing out the boards by, you know, putting the wrong jumper in the wrong hole. So that was the inspiration behind it. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's pretty full featured and compact actually, because um, not only do you have the, 
ESP32 with some 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 buttons and um, and so forth. Uh, you, you know, you've got this screen, like you mentioned, and then also a uh, potentiometer and this um, this temperature sensor. So it's it's actually pretty uh, pretty you know full featured. Actually, <laughs> it's nice. Yeah, thanks. I kind of put the the um, sensors that most people are already kind of familiar with for prototyping. And, you know, what's great about this and what's great about Arduino is all these sensor libraries are easily available, you know, from the community. So it's super easy to get started. And from the last chapter in my book where I talk about uh, web sockets for real-time dashboarding, and there we can use asynchronous caching rather than using synchronous like we do in the beginning chapters, is um, – I have like four of those input puts that are will display on the OLED screen and then get sent up to AWS IoT Core and dispatched using a web sockets with a couple of Lambda functions to a real-time dashboard. And so I have that. I have that code available, I believe, on my GitHub. So if anybody's interested in the board, I'm just selling it. Oops, we're kind of kind of losing you, Steve. Are you there? Maybe that's just me, but uh... no, definitely, I think. Okay, yeah. Hey, so, Steve, are I you there? I think he, he's muted now, but yeah. Hmm. Kind of lost him a little bit there towards the end, but uh, yeah. If you're if you're interested in this uh, cloud board, it's uh, it's a pretty neat. Um, development uh, board it's uh, you can find out more at cloudboard.cc so uh pretty nifty pretty nifty device uh hey, hey steve are you are you back um you were kind of cutting out there i think he's having some trouble yeah i like i like the design and how it's like based on the esp32 so it has kind of those uh, environmental sensors and uh, GPIOs and so forth. So kind of really typical. And the shape I like, it's like, looks like a small cloud. <laughs> yeah, that's what's really cool is the PCB itself is a cloud yeah. shape, which yes. you could see. Yeah. Okay. It looks like Steve's having some uh, technical difficulties with his audio. Kind of like I was earlier. Maybe we'll get him on in a second. Uh, he's he's dropped for the moment. Um, but um, but yeah, back to the back to the book. I think there's just a really a, a lot of really great examples there, and you know something you're you know you definitely want to check out. Uh, great topics. Um, okay, we're getting uh, Steve back here. Let me add him as a speaker. Yeah. So when it comes to uh, all of those links. Um, I think, yeah, we, we will provide um, the links as a reference after we finish the talk um, so that people can check it out. That's a good point. Yeah, thanks, Annette. Uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll post those uh, on Twitter, on the, on the uh, uh, Twitter feed. Is that right? Yes. Cool. Cool. Yeah, and All right. maybe, maybe we can also get the link to the book because maybe people are interested in, uh, you know, getting the book and giving it a read. Okay. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll post that as well after the uh, after the session here. I think we have Steve back. Are are you back? Do you hear us? Yeah, I hear you. I, I guess apparently, if someone calls you and you decline to call, you get booted off uh, Twitter Spaces for some reason. I don't know what happened with that. So, let oh, learn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're still we're still getting used to this platform. It's uh, it's great, uh, but there's a few little gotchas here and there. We're discovering. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. Any uh, let's see. Any questions uh, from you, uh, Nanad, Alina, Saeed? Yeah, I had this uh, question that was about the hardware. So, I mean, you. I think you mentioned like it took you kind of like three times to have the right version of the hardware produced. <laughs> Can you talk about that as well? And like 
Uh, yeah. So, you know, I think that would be pretty typical when you um, lay out a design and you get it produced. Um, there's always something that is going to go wrong. So I think the first thing that happened, I had somebody translate the files because they were more familiar with easy PCB after I originally designed it in Eagle. And I, there, there must have been something I didn't specify, but basically there's some analog sensors that require obviously ADC input to the ESP32. So that's not too advanced. Obviously you gotta make sure the pin going in from the sensor has to be capable of uh, audio to digital conversion. So that was something to get wrong, what was wrong with one version. And a little something that was more tricky was um, we used a DHT11 uh, sensor and then the part that was available was called the CHT11. But on the input pin, it had to ground the voltage in the input pin for the sensor from the ESP32 chip. It had to be a certain length. If it was too long or too short, you had to change the resistor value, and that wasn't on a pot, right? So you couldn't. Once it was uh, burned into silicon, you were baked into the PCB, you were done. So I had to lower the resistance because I realized the circuit path was a little bit longer than the specifications on the data sheet. So, you know, it was a single layer design, so probably it should have only taken two revisions. But, you know, if you're doing a multi, you probably are pretty familiar with this with your background, but if you're doing a multi-layer design with more active components, you got to be really careful on how you lay these things out because there's all kinds of things that can go wrong and it's, it's not cheap to fix. So, but this wasn't too bad. Overall, it wasn't really a bad design process. Yeah, definitely. More layers, more opportunity to make a mistake. <laughs> I want to ask you a question in regards with uh, WebSockets. How have you experienced or how was your feedback been with your uh, attendees and sessions you have done where uh, you have uh, provided in Chapter 18 uh, connections to WebSocket? Have you saw uh, experience among your uh, readers to be uh, a lot more uptake towards uh, web sockets, or it was more inclined towards normal MQTT path using HTTPS. So yeah, thank you for getting all the way to the last chapter of the book. I think you're probably one of the handful of people that have read through all the way, which is of course you know an issue with any online course or technical book. But the whole idea of really what I wanted to emphasize with the web sockets chapter is how do we do asynchronous IoT communication using a static website? Because obviously that's a big challenge, as you know, with serverless design, is how do we get data to the website not being on an EC2 instance? So WebSockets, to some degree, solves that issue. So to answer your first question, no, I haven't received a lot of feedback on that. But the implication of what you're saying is correct is, um, this whole idea of using WebSockets for IoT is a good opportunity, but there's issues, as you know, with using WebSockets. Besides the fact that with the protocol, you're probably going to get a disconnect without a warm Lambda after a few hours, which I don't mention in the book at all, because that's something you'd probably be more concerned with, but the beginner might not realize, so why bring it up? But there's other issues with WebSockets. I was talking with someone you're all familiar with at AWS, uh, James Beswick who, you know, super talented uh, web guy, Lambda guy, multi-language, very impressive. You know, I talked with him about this project, and he's all, yeah, have you encountered this pro problem with WebSockets? Have you encountered this problem? I'm on the aware of a couple of these, but, yeah, there's a lot of gotchas with WebSockets, but I think the whole idea is specifically for our IoT-centric design flow, just being able to use asynchronous IoT bi uh, bi-directional communications with WebSockets for pennies a day is something that would be very that is very interesting to most people. So that's kind of my view of the whole thing thus far. Yeah, I, I really like this minimalistic approach where you kind of like focus on this uh, be as as most efficient as possible in terms of resources. I think this is, yeah, really good for getting started and not kind of like, yeah, burning your wallet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, um, 
to talk about what you're saying is for a data store to hold a connection ID, I use the parameter store. But as you all know, you know, using the parameter store when you're going to have a number of different connection IDs and different con people, co different front ends connecting is problematic because you're not going to get the kind of speed or capacity, or at least not the speed. We don't have to worry too much about capacity. The speed mm -hmm. as you would for Dynamo or another database. So that's the problem if you try to do production level design. That's mm -hmm. going to be a big issue, for example. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, and it's, it's really good. Yeah, go on, sorry. No, I just want to say that managing web sockets is probably a nightmare at scale. Um, so I think um, it's, you know, services like, for example, AWS AppSync, they're trying to solve this problem. In fact, they're not trying, they're solving this problem. But I think managing web sockets at scale can definitely be challenging. Yeah, exactly. And I kind of just wave my hands at that because I'm like, let's get started and then worry about that later. Yeah, and, and I, it's also good, I mean, I see that you mentioned, like, you know, path to production in terms of like, okay, if you go want to go really advanced, then you can use something like DynamoDB or uh, other things. But yeah, this is kind of like to get you started, to get you familiar with the protocol and, and so forth. So That's right. And it's basically free, you know, because I think there's like a free, free 1 million parameter uh, sets, you know, pairs that you can use for free. So why not? Yep. So we, so we talked about the book, we talked about CloudBoard. Um, you, you know, something else we should mention is that you've got some Udemy courses also um, that uh, you're, you're offering around, uh, around IoT, right? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. So yeah, the Udemy courses, and the good thing about the Udemy courses is they're actually pretty profitable. So I'm a big fan of those. But uh, there's kind of two courses on AWS IoT. One's more of a beginner course, which focuses on connecting hardware and then just basic IoT centric services on AWS. And then I have my serverless design course, which, you know, half the book's materials based on that more advanced course. And that just goes over for you guys would be pretty basic design flows, but for people just learning IoT centric services on the cloud, then it's like, oh, these kind of set up how you would get started with using S3 and Lambda and Dynamo, kind of those big three, four, or five services that everybody needs to know for IoT and mostly for AWS in general. Yeah, that's, that's a really, you know, great place to start, um, you know, get your, uh, get your bearings uh, <laughs> to, to start doing uh, IoT development. Um, hey, uh, last week, uh, the team uh, talked about... Um, their favorite services on AWS IoT, uh, just as uh, kind of a fun thing to do. Um, maybe I'll pose that to you, Steve. What, what's your favorite service on on AWS IoT um, that you've uh, you, you know you find that you just enjoy using? Deep Racer. No, I'm just kidding. So the service that I most <laughs> probably say would be uh, what I definitely would stress in the long run is going to be the most important for everybody would definitely be Lambda. And uh, I know there was a comment on the Hero Slack channel that it's like, you know, AWS is always at these conventions talking about Lambda all the time. I don't, it's like, you know, my uh, tacit re response in my head was, I don't think you can ever talk about Lambda enough because Lambda is like, whether you're using normal services or IoT specific services, this is the glue in all these different programming languages, whether we're using a BOTO3 or a AWS JS SDK, so you can use different languages to import any AWS service under the sun. And as you guys know, there's a lot of them. So I always say don't, uh, you can't overestimate Lambda in its importance. So I would say that's my favorite. And then the two following that would be AWS IoT Core, the message broker, which is awesome. And S3, of course, because it's super durable, super functional, and super cheap. So those would be the big three, but Lambda would be number one. Mm. And do you typically use Lambda through the rules engine, or how, how do you usually kick off uh, you know, your Lambda functions? Yeah, exactly. So um, since AWS IoT Core, if we're going to stick with MQTT and not go around, around it to API Gateway, Normally, you don't want to do that anyway. So going through AWS IoT Core, 
through the rules engines, you have all these pre-made IoT-centric services using a rules query statement that you can dispatch your IoT data through. And of course, really, when you think about, I don't know, 15 or 20 services that are available through the rules engine, they're all basically front-end UXs for Lambda anyways. So, yeah, it's super handy, but if you want to do any kind of custom thing or get fancy and do some filtering up front that you can't do with the rules query statement, again, Lambda would be the place to do it using the event object. So um, it's super well integra integrated into the rules engine, as you said. Yeah, and I... I, you know, I guess, uh, th th would that make you a fan of Greengrass as well? Uh, since, uh, you know, Lambda functions really are at the core of, of uh, Greengrass. I am a fan of Greengrass for, especially for uh, factory and industrial automation, 100%. The only, and I do get on occasion, it's like, oh, you should do more things in Greengrass. And I'm, I'm definitely, I would. The only issue I have as a teacher and trainer working as a third party is I have to kind of think about, you know, where the audience is going to be and what I would need to do. So if I'm going to do something specialized kind of for more advanced, because I think green grass, we can all say is a little bit harder doing green grass deployments and Lambda deployments on devices for that arm seven architecture. It's, it's not going to be super suitable for the absolute beginner, you know? So, mm. you know, yeah, some of the workshops, yeah, some of the workshops can be a little lengthy uh, if you incorporate uh, green grass as well. There's some setup and things like that. I've done done some myself that have taken a little while to to get everybody up to up to speed. Yeah, that's my only issue, but it's super useful and super helpful. So I agree with you. I should do more in that area. Actually, I'm I'm gonna change the topic a little bit. I wanted to ask you. I've seen that you've got uh, a bunch of projects on Hexter.io. Um, is there any any project that you are super happy with and you'd like to tell us about? So the Hexter.io thing was kind of interesting. That was really something that was more of a big thing a few years ago. So. Uh, Hackster.io is one of these community kind of instructable websites where people can do basic device programming. And it wasn't even IoT centric back then. This is like five, four or five years ago. So, um, you know, they offered me kind of an ambassador program where they give me free hardware and then I would cover specific stuff with my meetup group in Portland. So that's how I got associated with them and wrote projects for that website. Um, I'm not really active on Hackster.io. They got bought by Avnet. You know, and so they kind of changed their model. I changed what I was doing. So I would say I would say only have one pro. I have one project on there that tended to be super popular that had like thirty thousand views, and that was just using like an ESP eighty two sixty six. That was even before the thirty two came out to use a um, kind of a cloud brokering verification uh, authentication service and send data to Google Sheets. People found that project really interesting, but you know, outside of that, I really haven't been posting too much on uh, Hackster.io. I posted a couple articles on Dev2, but no, I wouldn't say I would promote any articles on there, but if people are on Hackster.io, they do have a ton of good articles on different stuff and a lot of AWS IoT articles by many different authors. So it's definitely worth checking out. Cool, and um, I see you also have got uh, you know your your Git uh, your GitHub is really nicely organized, and you've got uh, nicely organized repositories for both of your Udemy courses. So yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting. I mean, people can just go straight into GitHub and see right away the examples and uh, sort of try things out before they take the Udemy course as well, and then you know follow your course. I think that's really cool. Yeah, I try, to, I try to keep a lot of things open source. A lot of things, you know, beginners would see, they're not going to be able to utilize without seeing what the context is with the course or the book. But one thing I will mention, whether someone buys the book or someone wants to buy the cloud board at cost for me right now, I don't care about that, or someone wants to take the course, is my email is available through the GitHub or, you know, if anybody wants to ask me any questions, uh, you know, I'm pretty responsive customer service orientated to help people out. I've seen most of the same questions over and over. So I normally don't mind, 
you know, the only, the only kind of questions that I think everybody has experience with this is it might be someone might ask you a question and really not understand the fun, fundamentals. So they can be a little bit of a time sink, but 80% of the questions I'm happy to answer and spend some time to get people up and going with any of these projects or what they see on the GitHub. That's fantastic. Oh, thanks, Steve. Hey, any, uh, any uh thing you wanted to mention um you know before we start winding down i know it's uh it's rapidly approaching the top of the hour um was there anything else you wanted to uh, highlight no i would just say again i appreciate you guys having me on this uh twitter spaces this has been very awesome and nice meeting you guys and i would say the only thing i would um offer is if someone wants to get that book i'm still looking for more feedback on the book you know, so if people get the book and anything is not understandable, I think Amazon offers a 30-day free refund on these Kindles anyways. So if they don't like it, they can just take it back. But And, I, you know, I'm, I'm offering it like nine ninety nine, so it's not a big profit center for me anyways. But I definitely would like more feedback on the book. And then if anybody's like, wants to use a specific chapter for a specific project, I'd be happy to answer questions on that too. Just feel free to email me or get a hold of me via Twitter or whatever. So other than that, not really. I mean, my stuff's all out there. My name's pretty unique, luckily. So if someone Googles me, they can find all my stuff on the web. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thanks a lot for uh, for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. And uh, it's been a really uh, great conversation. I think uh, some really neat topics. Um, anything uh, from the... From the team, uh, before before we wind down with Steve. No, okay, well, great. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Steve, uh, for for joining us, and um, appreciate your time. And uh, hey, uh, Ninad, tell us uh, about next week's episode. We've got uh, we've got coming up. Oh yes, that is an excellent point. So the next episode, we'll have Joseph uh, from Mender.io, and we will be, he's, an, he's a Yocto expert, so we'll have him joining us, and then we'll talk about IoT devices and then how you update the operating systems on them, right? So that's kind of the main topic. So feel Great. free to join. Yeah, check it out. Uh, tune in next Wednesday, same time, 8 a.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Uh, Central European time. Um, wanted to thank again Steve for uh, for his time today. Go check out his uh, his book on Amazon.com, uh, the Kindle edition. Uh, it's called AWS Serverless IoT: Inexpensive IoT Projects to Take You from Zero to AWS IoT Hero. Uh, so yeah, great. Um, I think that's that's it. Any any last comments before uh, before we wind down? Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, talk to you next week, same time, and uh, so long. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers, bye.